ladies and gentlemen, uh, mm -hmm. this evening I am going to present to you some dramatic readings from Eugene Onegin, the greatest uh, novel as well as greatest poem because it's a novel in verse by uh, Alexander Pushkin, Russia's greatest poet. Uh, I'll, uh, in, I'll try to accustom you right away uh, to how the thing works so that you'll feel at home. And I've taken the, the first stanza and I'll recite it for you in Russian and then I'll translate it. And that will be the, on the only Russian language part of the program because we have so much to say about the main topic. Did, did, did you get what my main topic is? Pushkin's hero, Tatyana Laryana. Yeah. That's very important because the book is called Eugene Onegin, but it's yeah. a question whether that should be the title at all, really, in a way. So here we go. Uh, sonnet number one. And uh, it's a novel in verse. Pushkin calls it Roman v Chichach. His words are novel in verse. So all the way through, you're going to be hearing sonnets. And in my translation, of course, there'll be sonnets. Мой дядя самых честных правил, когда не в шутку за немох, Он уважать себя заставил и лучше выдумать не мог. Его пример другим наука. Но, боже мой, какая скука с больным сидеть и день, и ночь, не отходя ни шагу прочь. Какое низкое коварство полуживого забавлять, ему подушки поправлять. Печально подносить лекарства, вздыхать и думать про себя, когда же черт возьмет тебя. Little kids in, in uh, Russia, as I understand it, who, who learn this poem, uh, often memorize the beginning. Uh, if so, it's a bit must be a bit of a shock to their parents, although their parents went through the same thing, so they've probably become accustomed to it. But th the language is a bit rough. So we start chapter one, and here's how it goes. The first stanza, sonnet. My uncle, oh, by the way, maybe you've noticed it had, they have four beats, not five, the way Shakespeare used. Mm -hmm. Also, the, the rhyme scheme, which is consistent throughout, was invented by Pushkin and has nothing to do with Shakespeare's, although you'll probably enjoy the couplet at the end, which may well, uh, as uh, Cheryl suggested to me before the show, uh, have been borrowed from Shakespeare. My uncle... Man of meat demeanor, when he at last indeed grew ill, required attendance. Nothing keener was felt by that relentless will. His life a moral may afford, but how to keep from being bored all night, all day, with bedside chat, and never take a break from that? What Creeping, cheating, and a deceit to keep the dying entertained, puff up the pillows, then look pained to bear a medicine not sweet, and think the deadline's overdue. When will the devil come for you? Okay. That's Eugene's thoughts, but doesn't uh, uh, the author very nicely get inside his character's mind? And uh, uh, yes. Then, of course, I reply to everything. Did I did I mention that? This is two novels in one. For every sonnet Pushkin writes, I write a sonnet reply. And in that way, we converse together. And I'll tell you another habit of Pushkin's, which I copy. He barges in. This novel is only half about Eugene O'Neill, or less than half. It's half. It's a quarter about him and a quarter about uh, um, the, her the hero, as I called her, uh, Tatiana Larina. And the other half is all about the narrator. That he borrowed that technique from Lord Byron, who in his uh, best-selling poem, uh, Child Harold, the most popular poem in Europe in 1812, uh, set the precedent for always barging in any time you like. And then Lord Byron continued that. He kept it up throughout his career in, in his second big poem, uh, Don Juan, uh, as they call it mm -hmm. in Britain, Don Juan, he barges in also. And so I barge in with mm -hmm. my replies to sonnets throughout the book. Here we go. Friend Zoya 
Learning I had made a promise, when at last retired, I'd write a sonnet daily. Weighed the thought, if sonnets be desired, and Yegin, why not render? You may entertainment find, and two will have some practice at your craft. At first I, quite unwisely, laughed. And Yegin, Englishers are not, and never were, in short supply. Another needed? Really? Why? I'd too quick-thinkingly forgot. My heart could write replies and be a partner in a colloquy. That's been my theme throughout, right? Last time yes. we had that inter internal interview between uh, Rückert and uh, the ancient Chinese. And then before that, uh, mm -hmm. I interviewed all sorts of Russian lyric writers. Now, I also have, uh, just as a, as a way of getting you into the story, uh, 1.5, chapter 1, uh, uh, sonnet 5, uh, mm -hmm. he's talking about uh, Anyagin growing up and learning the skills of uh, uh, conversing in polite aristocratic society. Mm -hmm. We all have learned to master this and that in amply variant ways. Well-bred will fit right in won't miss the prompt reward of social praise. And Yegin could his speech endear to stringent critics and austere. Well-read, if a pedantic lad, he happily the talent had in conversation, unconstrained to touch but glancingly on themes with look that filled with learning seems. In grave debate be self-contained, and then surprise, make ladies smile whom flashing epigrams beguile as uh, as pushkin does in his poem he barges in and i will barge into and talk about myself and my life with skill which had the fair beguiled our wise anyagin prophesies the time when sprightly oscar wilde with lightning wit might quips devise how fallen how changed our life today i lately heard a student say it's kind of like I'm going, whoa, and she's like, wait, and I'm, you know, I'm, well, well it's kind of like, I mean, it, it's sort of like, she's going to go, and how uncool is that, and oh, it's, oh my God, it's like the scene where if the guy's just got to stay, a chick will go, I mean, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I really enjoyed that as uh, yeah. even more than most others in this entertaining book. <laughs> yeah. I actually heard something that sounded very like that when I visited campus and I was just sitting on a bench and a couple of students were sitting next to me and this was precisely their dialect and I memorized it. <laughs> 223, okay, 223. Uh, we have... Uh, and we get it, I get my chance to introduce you to our hero, and that that's it's increasingly a gender neutral term, isn't it? Uh, our hero um, Tatiana and her sister Olga, shy, modest, and obedient, forever happy as the morn, poetic, lived, and guileless, lent a kiss that spoke of love newborn, with sky blue eyes that light beguile, with flaxen tress and ready smile, her movements, tone, slim figure, all in Olga. Reader, please recall some novel, any, you will find her portrait, lovely, sprightly elf, but I, who liked it once myself, am now of quite another mind. Can't stand it. Reader, don't demur. Her older sister, I prefer. <laughs> That's the biggest bit of barging in you, you ever heard, isn't it? Yes. We no sooner learn about Olga than we learn we really didn't need to bother with her at all. It's the other, it's the sister that counts from the narrator's point of view. And here is my reply. The storyteller and the critic in such experimental art are blent, 
reactions analytic inseparable from the heart of what we soon will come to see as twofold personality. The artist critic role design sorry, designed as colloquy of heart and mind. In Ludwig Tieck's fine Puss in Boots, the hearers too would have their say and loudly comment on the play with critical satiric, wit critical satiric, suits a dialogic attitude with Riley wanton style imbued. A, a, a roughly contemporary writer in Germany, along with Pushkin, wrote a play called Puss in Boots, where he has members of, of the audience rise up and shout out right in the middle of the play what they think about what the heck is going on here. Tatiana was the sister's name, not hitherto in novels found. Self-willed, though we are not to blame, we think our odd selection sound. Why not? Malifluent to say, although I know that in a way it might recall archaic days or memories too common rays. In names too little taste we show of poetry I'm steering wide. Enlightenment won't quite abide with us. It had no chance to grow as yet. A strained affectedness. That's all we've gained or even less. Reply. Our poet is a connoisseur of proper names. He notes a few of those he claimed sound sweetlier than most. The Hellenes liked them too. Thus Theodora, Agathon, and Thecla he admires, and on the theme of high and low he finds mid simpler folk these finer kinds. A special name was needed for a maiden whom he wished to prove high thought to noble deed might move, uncommon. Quite unlike the boar, the junior sibling seemed to be, as we have just begun to see. Is, this is all a bit of a digression on the unusualness of the name Tatiana. It wasn't common for, for lady, ladies and the gentry to get this name. And we'll learn later on that Tatiana's mother's favorite best-selling novel, on which she based a whole lot of her feelings and ideas, was Pamela by the Englishman Richardson. Okay. And it's interesting, he, the 18th century uh, novel, novel writer and bestseller producer, uh, Richardson had the same uh, problem uh, with his readers and Pamela. That wasn't a common name either. He got lots of complaints, or not complaints, but, but uh, questions. How do you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. Might be Pamela, you know, if you've never heard it before. <laughs> anyway, Tatiana is not, wasn't a common name at the time, but you can bet it's a common name today. Mm. Tatiana, then, will call her. She will call her, barging in as, I'm the novelist here, I'll do what I want, yes. Mm -hmm. She, without her sister's beauty rare, without that freshness fair to see, appeared with an estranging air, unsociable. Sad, quiet, staid, a timid doe in sylvan glade. She to her own dear family, a stranger maiden seemed to be. She felt a distance, I would say, from mother, father. Though a child, she took small part in children's wild, loud laughing, leaping, avid play, but often spent the live long day beside a window, hid away. Reply. Apart from lives of saintly males in Russian writing, t'wasn't done to show a thoughtful child who fails to join the others in their fun. In English fiction, not so rare. So Charlotte Bronte drew Jane Eyre, concentered on her thoughts alone. In Buick's birds, an emblem shown of northern solitude would be. On shore of Greenland, Iceland, bleak, might Jane a mirror likeness seek, for she'd been treated icily. So death-white realms imagining, would she an inward saga sing? It's fun to draw these parallels with Jane Eyre. I used to teach Jane Eyre to the wonderful book. Tolstoy read it and gave it high praise. It's extremely well written. Well, for one thing, Charlotte and her two sisters spent a good bit of time in a, in a French school in uh, Belgium. 
and they went through a rigorous oh. uh, tra training in French style. And I think that paid off. Yeah. They write like poets, all of them. Hmm. All right, let's go on then. I'm going to just read on because we're learning more about um, our hero all the time. A pensive mood had been her friend from earliest of cradle days. The hours the folk in leisure spend repicturing in dreamy ways. Her tender fingers never came too near a needle. Broider frames she'd never used that patterns might with silken grace the cloth delight, but showed a liking for control. Her patient doll would she prepare, in jesting play for conduct fair with lessons. A parental role in these her lectures would be clear. She'd emulate her mama, dear. A threaded pattern used to be, this is my reply, combined with moral lesson while a girl would make, how dexterously, a sampler motto, fine in style. Have you seen these mottos? Yeah. They were popular in the 18th century uh, from colonial times, 19th. A sampler motto fine in style. So from the 18th century, examples ravishing I'd see in one artistic exhibition of our colonial tradition. Of course, Tatiana, with her love for independence, mightn't care to trace the preset proverb where direction came from those above. I'll quote for you a sample I could in that old exhibit spy. Okay, time for me to barge in here. I'm not even going to bother writing a sonnet. I just put mm -hmm. it on in as a supplement. And the title of the book is A Form True Dialogic Verse Translation with Lyrical Replies and Supplements. And it happens mm -hmm. that I took my daughter at just about this time to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And they were having a special exhibit of samplers written by mm. young women in, in the 18th and 19th centuries. And here's one that I actually copied down in, in our experience book. I took my daughter whenever I'd go anywhere, uh, along with an experience book with blank pages, and we would write things down. Oh, nice. nice. So this is called Metropolitan Museum Exhibit Poem Transcribed. With Sheba's queen, ye American fair, to adorn your mind, bend all your care. How blessed the maid, whom circling years improve, her God the object of her warmest love, whose useful hours successive as they glide, the book, the needle, and the pen divide, who sees her parents' heart exult with joy, and the fond tear stands sparkling in their eye. Hmm. Can't you picture the girl comes home from school and her parents couldn't possibly be happier and they frame it right away in the parlor? <laughs> yeah. Tatiana will have none of that. Sharon, have a comment on it? Yeah, I just, I, I was just looking to see, is, this, is the quote from the sampler there or the adage or whatever you'd call it? But I think you're just describing the process. The the sampler is is the text itself that the girl was embroidering in. Embroidering. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. the, the, the eighteenth. This is every word was exactly as not just not written but sewn onto a sampler cloth by an eighteenth century girl. Wow. <clears throat> okay. All right. Yep, she's yep. Not, she's not oh. in, in, indoctrinated rather thoroughly as to what she should say. Yeah. It's, it's very obedient. It is pious. It is correct. Okay. Elegantly written, too. I like mm -hmm. it very much. Tatiana, at the time with, which we are speaking of, had left her doll. The fashion trends and gossip she would not, in talk with her, recall. And other whims of childhood were in equal measure strange to her. But horror tales on wintry night enthralled her heart with chilling fright. When Nanny kindly would invite her child friends to a meadow wide, she'd not play tag, but stand aside and turn away her troubled sight. Their laughter seeming tedious and silly, all their trivial fuss. Hmm. See, this is a pretty odd kid. She reads the equivalent of Edgar <laughs> Allan Poe while the other kids are out playing outside. Mm -hmm. Reply, I've sighted lonely youthful dreamers 
in Bronte and in Mansfield Park, Jane Austen's Fanny Price, redeemers of a value midst a moral dark. But these were each a Cinderella. Stendhal, indeed, a Cinderfella portrayed in Julien Sorel. I don't know if you've ever read The Red and the Black. I didn't. But no. that's naturally our hero, Julien, has two brothers, and he hates their guts, and the feeling is mutual. Parable, the parables such writers tell show each protagonist maltreated by a pair of brothers, sisters, or of sibling-like despisers. For a happy ending, these defeated must be. Tatiana, unrejected, calm solitude, herself selected. Hmm. She loved upon the balcony to wait the mild arousing day with gaze on pale horizon sea the fading starry roundelay the bound of earth becoming bright the morning wind with herald light the day shine gradually made in winter long the nightly shade possesses half the world beneath and as that veil in soothing quiet, views misty moon, is cradled by it, while sleeping east will barely breathe. At her established time to rise, lit candles guide Tatiana's eyes. Hmm. He really identifies with her, doesn't he? I think he makes her into a very Pushkinian kind of nature-loving poet. How old do you think, uh, how old is Tatiana and, at this point in her life? You tell me. She sounds 12 or 13. That maybe? sounds about right. Yeah. I'd say yeah. So. Okay. Actually, I like to read about her because she resembles in some respect my daughter at that oh. age and other ages. My daughter was very much a self-manager. That's uh, nice. She did not like to be told what to do. She will tell yes. you. Yes. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> we need daughters like that. We do need that. Yeah. Reply. The twilight, tween light, gloom and sun. That so attracts the poet mind will emblemize how two in one by living metaphor we find. The dusk and dawn alike must be sweet Eden times of reverie, for being and the nothing are a swelling then dispelled, a star. And why does Tanya love the moon? A trinal light, thrice holy she, Lucina or Lucina. Diane, Hecate, and why the night, the highest boon for poets in the realm of dream, we're whelmed beneath a sea of seam. Hmm. I try to get a bit poetical myself there. Yes. Uh, poets love the, the, the twilight, the tween light of uh, a morning and evening. Those are very poetical times of day. Everything seems slightly unreal. Yeah. She early was of novels fond, transported by the story flow. She loved the ever magic wand of Richardson and of Rousseau. Her, her dad, an easygoing chap, tastes antiquated as twould hap, cared little what the girl would read. He never turned a page, indeed, nor sacrificed an hour of sleep to worry what his daughter choose, for books were toys they might amuse, and underneath her pillow keep. The passion that his helpmeet had for Richardson near drove her mad. The helpmeet is uh, his better half, his wife. Oh. Yes. That's an old way to talk, but uh, we're writing yeah. about a novel yeah, of eight, yeah. 1833. I do that now and then. Uh, and so her uh, Tati Tatiana's mother is crazy about Richardson, the bestseller. Okay. By the way, you really have to be interested in reading to although we do learn in a while that it's not even clear whether uh tatiana's mother read richardson or just list just gossiped about her with the neighbor uh, because richardson takes some doing he's he writes books hundreds of pages long yeah. i found it hard to get through pamela even in the abridged edition did yeah. you try well i think yeah michael conlin's course had uh -huh. pamela and uh, I think we even had Shamala. Oh, <laughs> good, for, good for you. That would be a refreshment. Yeah, yeah. Fielding's parody. Yes. 
Now I explain to you a bit about Rousseau. Many people have yes. heard of his confessions and his political okay. theory, social contract, but not too many people know any more about his novel, uh, La Nouvelle Héloïse, The okay. New Héloïse. And the reason they don't know much about it nowadays is that he writes even more than Richardson, or at least it's a it's a neck and neck competition. Hundreds, <laughs> hundreds. Of pages. Rousseau's The Recent Eloise, I've never read. I'd best, I confess. Dear reader, pray forgive me, please, and even esteem me nonetheless. For medieval Abelard and his Louise, dread fate was hard. A monk and nun were not allowed to act as these had done. He bowed perforce to what a foe had thought appropriate. But I demur. Unmanning never should occur, no matter what some doctrine taught. The newer Eloise, to me, could not a pleasant prospect be. So you... he was writing about Eloise, Eloise? And now, Eloise? it happens that Rousseau did not write about Eloise in the Middle oh, Ages. Okay. He wrote his novel and he proceeded to call it La Nouvelle, the New Eloise. This okay. is the, in other words, I'm going to rewrite the medieval story of Eloise and Abelard. And okay. a darn good thing he did too, because you know, he was castrated for what- I know. <laughs> That's no, that's no uh, uh, thing that you want to include nowadays. Instead, no. he writes a story. I won't say it's a happy story. Rousseau has what looks inside himself when he writes. And he had one of the most unhappy love stories I can think of. And so the new, El new Eloise is not one that you would get a great deal of pleasure out of. But even the title, as I put, uh, made it very clear here, uh, in a way, turns me uh, in the other direction. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, it would be the sort of thing that might attract, if not uh, the, the, the undevoted reader of, uh, uh, such as Ta Tatiana's mother, at least some of her lady friends, and they'd be talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Rousseau and, and uh, Richardson are the trendiest of the day. Okay. Actually, you're well prepared for this uh, book, Cheryl, if you took Mike Conlon's course in 18th century. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Perfectly prepared. Yeah. But why this love for Richardson? She'd never read that great auteur, nor could it be that Grandison to Lovelace she'd perhaps prefer. But long ago, Princess Aline, who lived in Moscow, her cousine, these people would in talk portray. And at that time, her fiancé, I put mm. this, look at this is only in parenthesis, she'd marry him against her will. Ranked second in her own esteem to someone else, her perfect dream, dubbed Grandison, it gamble hard, a dandy sergeant of the guard. Mm -hmm. I don't know that uh, I'm not going to even risk commenting on uh, uh, young uh, women nowadays, uh, whether they get entrapped by these trends, but this poor lady was imprisoned. Uh, even her, even her would-be fiance, whom she didn't get to marry anyway, took second place to a hero of Richardson. Her Richardson came second hand, but that's all right. He's all the rage, far famed throughout the Russian land and mentor of the present age. To Pamela, in Pamela he showed a maid who traps for her employer laid, but kept his mind on wedding bells. Allurement paired with patience tells. You notice that's quite a time, a time saver. Cheryl, in four lines, I summed it up. <laughs> Yep. She traps for her employer laid, but kept his mind on wedding bells. Allurement paired with patience tells. The soldiers Richardson got scrambled, for Grandison's morality proves nearly perfect as can be. He never sank or drank or gambled. Confusion, though, is nothing new when we, the Russian nobles, view. Hmm. Like him, she would with care be dressed in fashion and becomingly, but caring not what she thought best. They led her to be wed, pardee. Arranged marriages, yes, the, 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 the custom at that time. They led her to be wed, pardee, then to distract her from the woe. The prudent groom had planned they'd go off to the village that he owned. She there at first had raved and moaned and wept. The panic might have meant, if unrestrained, a dire divorce. 
at household labors take their course, she got accustomed, was content. Thus habit from on high will bless and take the place of happiness. That happens to be one of my all-time favorite couplets from Pushkin. It sounds beautiful in Russian. Purivuchka svushenam dana zamiena shastiyu ana. Thus habit from on high will bless and to take the place of happiness. That's a very Pushkin mooded uh, couplet. He often combines irony with a uh, bit of nostalgia uh, and yeah. humor. Irony, it's, it's irony and, it, and it's a bit of sadness, but with a, with a touch of wit. Yeah. An apt concluding adage, we appreciate the stoic thought. The author conscientiously informed us who the lesson taught. He read it in Chateaubriand, Mojiste indeed, and with Elan delivered. Through your notes we go, dear poet, and our holdings grow. I too refer to many things in my replies, and if there be a commentator who for me plans similar attributings, I only ask that such a one write Pushkin stanza. Have some fun. See, I'm... I don't see why I should be the last. Some other uh, aspiring poet may wish to jump in too. <laughs> <laughs> Write a third novel. Um. So habit mollified the grief that never tongue might well express, but perfect solace and relief would come. Discovery would bless. In work and leisure would she find a way to guide her husband's mind with grandly autocratic strength, and conflicts all were calmed at length. She'd travel where her errands lay, salt mushrooms for the winter save, expenses managed, heads would shave, went bathing every Sabbath day, in wrath slapped servants in the house, nor would consult her humbled spouse in other words okay. i married uh, hmm? go ahead well i have a question so Please. this is chatanya's mother right exactly yeah okay are they exiled or self-exiled they're not exiled anywhere oh i mean i thought he took her away from the glamour of the court and the city oh well it, no they lived in a rural estate to start with okay he okay. took uh, Tatiana's mother away from those novels of Richardson and Rousseau, ah. where passion was glamorized. And now it turns out that household chores are what life is about. And that's not such a bad thing if you can micromanage and tell people what to do right and left. <laughs> okay? That's that what's being okay. said here. Yeah. Quite a lot, actually, in a short space. Oh, I had fun with this reply. Idyllic Mitchell, that's Margaret Mitchell, Gone with the Wind, has to yield to, at last to sterner Beecher Stowe. Gone with the Wind can't show who'll wield the slaver's wrath, Legrian woe, but said Tom's cabin best would show how far the cruelty could go in slave plantations hateful life with angry malefaction rife. So if the lady here will shave the head of one she owns, then he for 25 long years must be a soldier and a woman slave, the frenzied mistress, fever willed, may hit until her zeal be stilled. So she practiced corporal punishment on the women that she owned, since she owned them. Uh, she didn't treat her slaves well, and if she, they got on her nerves, or simply if she wanted perhaps more room for guests in the house, she, she'd shave the heads of some of the people and send them off to serve for 25, the men, to serve for 25 yes. years in the army. It wow. could be that my, my uh, grandfather be blessed, <laughs> mm -hmm. not wanting a fate like that in the Ukraine, yes. uh, out of there as fast as he could. And I have the passport my grandmother gave me from 1913. Wow. Ukraine was a good place to leave in 1913. Yes. And for that matter, I wouldn't care to be there just right at this moment either. <laughs> no, no. 
So now we go ahead. She'd write in blood as might be seen in Maiden's album keepsake books. That's a rather startling thing. Apparently to do your signature in, in blood, uh, just a little bit from the finger, uh, which would show uh, attachment to your lady friend in her keepsake book. Praskovia, her friend pa Praskovia, she'd rename Pauline because You've got, you're going to talk French. You don't want to throw in Russian names in the middle of a French conversation. And French is the language of the elite culture. She drawled with high toned noble looks. A narrow corset sported she, and N made Gallic nasally. On, un. French is full of those sounds. And as with fads of any day, this make believe would fade away. That album and Princess Aline. The sentimental poems all, she'd these forget, no longer called Akulka Frenchified Céline. Her quilted robe and nightcap she would wear that even a guest might see. That's interesting. She wears her nightgown and her nightcap uh, even when guests come, sort of like the, the, uh, the king's dressing in the morning, right? The chamberlains would gather round and watch. Yes, yeah. The levee. Um, yeah, the levee, that's the word. Yes. Naturally, yeah. a French, French word. <laughs> and it, and yes. it was describing such kings as Henry, uh, yes. sorry, Louis XIV. Yeah, yes. Wow. This is so masterful, obviously. This you is so you learn a whole lot as you go along, don't you? Yeah, you do, yeah. Vicissitudes, this is my reply. Vicissitudes of nation aping, it may divert us here to trace. First Peter's up-to-date reshaping, that's Peter the Great, mm -hmm. he copied the Germans and the Dutch. In fact, Sankt Peterburg is the name he gave the, uh, the capital on the Baltic, af named after himself, but the name, form of the name is Dutch, These because the Dutch taught him shipbuilding and trained his newly born navy. Um, See, so Peter the Great wanted to Russianize, to modernize the Russian state, and he did it on the backs of the serfs uh, by modernizing the army, the navy, and the bureaucracy. Hmm. What more do you need? <laughs> it may, oh yes, first Peter's up-to-date reshaping were German, Dutch, had pride of place, then Catherine, the no less great, as an example sent to emulate the French, will let a token be the written spoken poetry that Russians penned in the Gallic tongue. In Tsarskaya Silo, that's the town where Pushkin went to high school, our mm -hmm. bard French poems wrote. It wasn't hard. He spoke it all the time when young. Bard Belmont, though, would gladly banish all trace of France and hail the Spanish. I may lose a few readers there who haven't heard of Belmont. Her husband loved her heartily and let her manage the estate. A perfect faith in her had he. In dressing gown he drank and ate. So life continued much the same, and in the evening often came the neighbors, like a family, who quite good-natured seemed to be. They'd share a grief or glad deride, or laugh a bit at this and that. The time will pass, and all is packed, and Olga here will tea provide. Comes dinner, sleep, a happy day. The guests contented ride away. I'm commenting now. The civilized amenities of rural living we have heard described in pleasant melodies that gently breathe. And if a word is uttered, tis because it came more softly than an eye of flame to a sparkle with a wetness blent to mild the sprightly element. The kindness in the speech of friends that know not how to scold or chide unfolds what will in lives abide where sky is sent liking. Never ends. Oh, love, who are the life of me? By you let mercy worlded be. Uh, some people may wonder what called forth all of that. I think I was soon to get married. I think I was very much in love at the time. And the idea of love appealed to me, so I let myself go. Next. They'd in their tranquil life preserve loved legacies of yesteryear. Shrove Tuesday'd come, and they would serve the Russian pancakes all hold dear. Mardi Gras, right? Do you know when that is this year? 
I do because I looked it up. When is it? March 1. Oh. March the 1st. It's just around the corner, Shrove Tuesday. So it is. Yeah. Fat Tuesday. I don't know what, what what's the big point of eating fat on uh, or greasy things on, on Shrove Tuesday. I, I could look I think you're, you're, you're storing up for, for Lent because oh. Lent is coming. Oh, I see. It'll fatten you up, so to speak. I never well, thought. Well, yeah, it's the last day of uncontrolled eating. Exactly. And so. exactly. Next uh, day is Ash Wednesday. And Mardi Gras means uh, it's the carnival. It's and Fat Carnival. Tuesday, yeah. No, Fat Tuesday. And Carnival means farewell to meat. Oh, Carne, Carnevale. Oh, okay, isn't that interesting? Yes. Meet, meet goodbye. Oh, yeah, okay. Twice yearly they devoutly fast. On carousel fine times they passed. They carols liked and round a lay. On Trinity when people may, while yawning, hear a solemn prayer. They'd on the lovage tenderly. Their tears let fall in droplets three, and kvass they drank as if to her air. When guests were served, the ordered be by rank and by seniority. I went to Russia in 1962, and I noticed yeah. that there were vending machines everywhere selling kvass. It's a kind of mild beer, but there were no age oh. restrictions. You, you, anybody could buy some kvass. Huh. It must have been fun for a teenager. I'm not personally myself very fond of beer, so I didn't go nuts yeah. over kvass either. Reply. Yeah. Shrove Tuesday, which we know as fat because of Mardi Gras, would mean a chance to eat rich pancakes that in Lent were banished from the scene. The teacher, incidentally, who Gribayedov taught to me, his woe from which a play far famed, was Pancake or Blinova named. Blinova, Blin is a pancake. Maybe yes. you have heard, heard of blintzes. They're so good. <laughs> <laughs> Yiddish diminutive of pancakes. Yeah. Uh, but really the word is Russian. A carnival to celebrate is common then. Concurrently, a cello burial we see to lamentably indicate no dancing during Lent. I'll show how cello ceremonies go. This is a very, very interesting thing. And in many ways... <coughs> Studying Russian culture with Pushkin taught, uh, motivated me to learn a little bit about the culture around here. I wasn't brought up sh celebrating Shrove Tuesday or Mardi Gras. Yeah. Uh, so I thought, what exactly do you do? And then I came upon this thing uh, where uh, uh, you have carnival. We don't have carnival with masks. But I did learn that in uh, Binghamton, New York, two different groups of people celebrate the burial of the cello. Oh. I never heard of that. It's it goes on. It, when I was writing this, uh, it was going on and flourishing, and I went to both parties. One of them held by the German club. I was a member of the mm -hmm. German club at the time, and the other are staged by the uh, the Czech Czechoslovak people at the Saint Cyril and Methodius Church. And in mm -hmm. each case, the ritual was basically this. Uh, it had the same idea. You bury a cello because the ce it isn't a real cello. You make one uh, okay. up, out of this and that, uh, whatever's handy. And, and you paint it well so it looks properly like wood, I guess. And um, then you, you, uh, you bury it. Uh, and that sim symbolizes the end of dancing. Cello uh, is, a, is a good, uh, uh, um, um, as, what should we say, uh, used for uh, village and rural dances. Okay. So it's a, treated as a folk instrument and to be buried for Lent, right? Because mm -hmm. no dancing during Lent. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you have a party because this yeah. is not Lent. This is the day before. But at the same time, it's a funny sort of party. It's a fun funeral what James Joyce once called a fun for all. <laughs> hmm. uh, it's a fun funeral because you're, it's a burial service. The difference between the, the, uh, the Germans and the Slavs is that in German, they had uh, an actual funeral lament in Latin recited by the, the fake priest. Whereas yeah. the fake priest in the Czechoslovak burial sang a, a, Scot, a, 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 a Slovak a folk song instead. Oh. Doubtless a sad one. I couldn't make it out what it meant. Huh. Ready for the beggar's ball, sponsored by the German American Club, Vestal, New York. I anticipate tomorrow night when the German Club, a beggar's ball, will be holding 
Not to be a sight, you in contrast are a vision. All the garments I have bought today I'd call casual, not ragged. That seems right. You'd eschewed the vagrant option, wise to avoid an overstrange display. Comedy, though no one need despise, good Salvation Army clothing may suit the relaxation of the day. Jeans and plum-hued top, a compromise. That's what uh, my lady friend had decided she would wear. Oh. When the ornamental contrabass they call it a contrabass. It's actually, a, it's the size of the cello. Mm. German club officiants with care bury in a snug secluded place, lending thus for Lent a sober air to the merry room. No gloom will dare overtake the mourners who might face for their consolation sweet to say, panacea is fitting to the fest. Every worry let us wish away. Contrabass in Lenten peace to rest will be laid with rituals mm, the best. Might you try a waltz, my fairy fay? Hmm. And now comes the Czechoslovak. It, actually, they were two nights in a row. Cello burial at the St. Cyril and Methodius Church. Do you know where that is? Quite a handsome oh. building, downtown Binghamton. Oh, okay. In a sort of mid Byzantine style. Mm. Come dance, waltz, polka, all you want. But here's what most the folks may vaunt. The cello wailed with baleful cry. They'll bury gloomy faces gaunt. They lay their hands upon their friend, whose days have hastened to an end, while march funereal with sigh of elegy will tribute send. The priest brings holy water. It's a bit of springtime slivovitz. <laughs> they know their priests with, with winking eye, a lady said, and wit that fits. A slivovitz is actually plum brandy. Okay. He'll, he'll sprinkle drops on the deceased, the heart of carnival released, quite gone, till Lent itself shall die and fast give way again to feast. Yeah. It sounds very different from Mardi Gras. Yes, it isn't Mardi Gras at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Different ethnicities and, uh, and right. traditions are quite right. distinct. But I yeah. love this double discovery about my very own hometown. Oh, and yeah. The Eastern European delights. I actually wrote my uh, my German teacher, who to, uh, today is 96 years old. She's a little younger, though not much at the time, <laughs> and asked her what she knew uh, from living in Germany about the burial of the cello, which yeah. I have celebrated. And she said, I was brought up Lutheran. We never heard of such a thing. Oh, <laughs> So it's a Catholic That's tradition. Interesting. Yeah, it's Catholic, but different. Well, obviously, because Lent. Wow. I think it'll be nice now for the for the last part of the program. If we proceed to chapter three, uh, that's okay. on uh, page 142. Okay. And uh, it's nicely uh, headed up with an epigraph from some French writer who's no longer well known today, Malfilatre. And what he said was, she was a girl, she was in love. <laughs> so what, what we do here in chapter three is, uh, as we before I was introducing you uh, uh, to uh, uh, the character of uh, Tatiana in her cultural co and family context, we proceed now to uh, uh, introduce her to Eugene. Okay. Where now? These poets baffle me. Goodbye, and yeah, again, time to go. I wouldn't keep you back, but see, I'm, I'm curious, be nice to know. The Larians, there's a fine surprise. Oh, mercy, do you find it wise? A way of killing time? Not bored? Not in the least. You mean it. Lord, I'm picturing an average night to sum it up. Would you agree? A simple Russian family makes every guest feel welcome, right? Preserves an endless talk 
what strain? The cattle barn, the flax, the rain. <laughs> My reply doesn't have a whole lot to do with Eugene Onegin. At this point, you can see he's a man who's very easily bored. Yes, uh, yes. In, even his name sometimes seems to me symbolic, though I've never seen a, a critic suggest that the, the O is a zero. Yeah, yeah. And the neg yeah. is neg negativity. Yeah, yeah. Suppose that in the USA, the forebear of our poets were not Whitman, Dickinson, but say the Pushkin type that I prefer. What then of last listing litanies, elliptic riddling quiddities? Instead, a world we'd live in where our daily talk would have the air of just created lyric speech, and anything we ever said would be by gods engarlanded with hearty harmony and reach, that easeful Eden where we rose, bright birds that never heard of prose. Hmm. In other words, he makes it seem like talking rather than poetry writing. He makes it yeah. seem like anything, uh, uh, nothing could be easier to do. Yeah. And I like that. Because if you believe that, you'll get into a mood where it comes true. Hmm. I still don't see a problem, though. The problem's being a bored, my friend. <laughs> Your stylish world, I loathe it so. With families, I like to spend my time so I... An eclogue, Lord, enough. The time I can't afford. But then, so what? You're gone, that's bad. Yet here's a question, Lenski lad. You think... This rural Phyllis I could meet, the one who occupies your thoughts and rhymes and tearful eyes. Say, introduce me. Joking. Why? Sure, I'd be glad. Say when. Let's go. They'll warmly welcome us. I know. Hmm. So this rural Phyllis is Phyllis the name of a beautiful girl uh, yeah phyllis know, is, idealized phyllis is a stereotype name in uh, okay. uh in uh, uh what should we say stories of uh, how a shepherd maiden falls in love okay phyllis is an ancient greek name and all the way back to theocritus in his idyls uh, or happy romances of country love they were using the name phyllis they just throw it in as a trendy name okay it's like okay. philadelphia Right. Huh? Like the town, city, Philadelphia. What about? The, oh, the that's cool. Yes, that means brotherly love, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have remnants of uh, Greek etymology floating around in our yeah. culture. You notice yeah. uh, another thing that he used, he called it rather ironically, an eclogue. That's a happy shepherd poem. Okay. So that's also, that's from ancient Rome and, and Greece also. Uh, okay. they, they, they get a bit of a classical education, these people, and they, yeah, throw, yeah. they throw the terms into their common speech. Reply. You know who best could emulate Anyagin lines, their lively breath? I recommend The Golden Gate by modern author Vikram Seth. He's from India, uh, okay. or at least his family was, but he's an American. And a very good writer. And he writes in Pushkin stanzas just the way I do. Oh, and he, okay. And he wrote a novel called The Golden Gate in Pushkin stanzas. We hear of San Francisco life, the 1960s, ugly strife when, he, when we had fought the Vietnamese and they defeated us with ease. The high point of the action came when throngs a speaker heard, a priest who railed against the bombs released, our blamable and lasting shame. All characters, including him, their sonnets made with grace and vim. Hmm. So the priest gives a disarmament speech in Pus Pushkinian sonnets. I thought that was a neat achievement. <laughs> yes. Then we come to... to uh, uh, sonnet 3.3. Mm -hmm. They're ready to be off to this party. Let's go. The men would soon be nigh the manor. There they'd be required with old time habit to comply as hospitable folk desired. One knows the favor that awaits. The jam passed round on little plates, on oilcloth cover, black as ink, the jugs of huckleberry drink. 
And then we have a tribute here to romantic subjectivity. Uh, the, the poet oh. couldn't think how to finish. So he okay. left the next six lines blank. Yes. He just left blank. Now, what am I going to do? I'm the commentator. Uh, uh -huh. I decided I would write roughly the same number of lines that Pushkin wrote uh, and uh, say something that Pushkin might have said about okay. the in incomplete nature of this contribution. Mm -hmm. Why missing lines? I guessed your thought. I'll fill you in. I wrote all six. But then, while I'd gone out to fix a wagon wheel, my cook had got some papers she supposed were trash <laughs> and put them in the flames. There, Ash. <laughs> hmm. I love to talk about this material. I'll, so yeah. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you another little secret. Uh, that if the joke is not mine. I didn't steal it from Pushkin. I took it from a short story by Gogol, the author of uh, The Overcoat. Did you yeah. read The Overcoat? And The yes. Nose and Diary of a Madman? Yeah. Well, at least The Overcoat. I'm not oh. sure. The Diary, maybe. I'm not sure. If you read The Nose, you'd remember that one. I didn't read The Nose. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wakes up one morning the protagonist of the nose, to discover his nose is missing and the area where it used to be is just as flat as a pancake. Oh. And the story goes on from there. Okay. Now, let's continue then. Uh, uh, that was uh, just a little bit of a comic diversion. Mm -hmm. They, by the shortest road proceeding, were homeward bent, full speed ahead. We'll meanwhile quietly be heeding our heroes talk as on they sped. What say, Onyegin? Yawning? Why? Mere habit, Linsky. Yet your sigh is not contented. I'm all right. The dark comes earlier each night. Let's go. Let's move it. Move, Andre. That's the coachman he's yelling mm -hmm. at. A stupid place to travel through. And Mrs. Larim, simple too. But really nice, I have to say. That berry drink, though, I'm afraid. <laughs> Great havoc in my system made. Whoops. <laughs> Since boredom can be boring, we'll discourse upon a sweeter theme. In 1962, I feel, I lived a brief idyllic dream. With other student friends, I cruised on Volga boat. A germ refused to leave my throat. A passenger said, tea and jams what I prefer to treat a cough, and where might, where might I have that cure? At my house, off we went. In what a friendly element I felt, the jam, a balm, a salve, in tea glass, raspberry preserves. You see how Slavic wisdom serves? Oh, that was nice. Wasn't it? A perfect stranger. Yes, he yes. turned out to be a uh, young, uh, young communist uh, group's member. Oh, okay. But he just, he didn't meet very many Americans. And uh, Russian American, Russian speaking Americans were a great rarity. Yes. He spoke Russian, of course, the whole time. And he got introduced to uh -huh. everyone, including the grandmother and the cat. <laughs> That's really nice. Oh, and by the way, we that's the third time we've had mention of raspberry preserves or other kinds of preserves or jam. Uh, that's, that's pretty big in Russian culture. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, it's particularly important to put raspberry jam at the bottom of a, of a glass of tea. Not oh. cup, not cup, but glass. And then you'd simply drink it. You'd drink the jam with the tea and your, your throat bug is gone. <laughs> That's really a nice cure. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Now, of the girls, which was Tatiana? The one with melancholy air, as still and quiet as Svetlana, who settled on the window chair. The shorter girls, the one for you? Why not? The other one I'd view as better for a Poet's wife. In Olga's features, not much life. Van Dyke's Madonna, sweet bijou. That's French for jewel. Mm. Her French so her face so rosy and so round. Just like that foolish moon, I'm bound. 
on that horizon, foolish too. Poor Lensky dryly spoke a word. Then perfect silence might be heard. He's going to marry this girl who's just been labeled as stupid as the moon. <laughs> I was thinking Olga was the mother. So I got that. Oh, wrong. they're sisters. They're sisters. They're sisters. Okay. Svetlana, compared with Tatiana, uh, was a pensive maid. Lenore of Burger Russianized. She melancholy was and stayed. The parallel is well advised. Zhukovsky set the German tale in lines that might belie the bale afflicting her, as Pushkin's teacher who'd sweeten each poetic feature of what the poet Burger wrote, he won the grateful reader's heart. Supreme in his poetic art, he'd only be excelled, we note, by him we're reading, who's the one, that day spring hid in summer sun. Hmm. Onegin with his visit had on everyone a strong effect. Impressions, whether good or bad, the ready neighbors would collect. Enigmas were on riddles piled, and people speaking whispered, smiled, and joked and judged, not timidly, and wondered when they'd wedded be. Some even thought the statements sound that all arrangements had been made, and that the marriage was delayed because no modish ring was found. On Lensky's wedding, all agreed. No further talk of that, they'd need. Hmm. So, uh, so Onegin has been supremely tactless, has he not? I mean, this this is a, mar a, a mar marriage pretty much uh, seized upon, uh, uh, decided upon. Every but all the villagers are uh, in accord on that, and yet yeah. he's telling he's telling Onegin, or rather, Onegin is telling Lensky that. Uh, uh, that his lady love is stupid as the moon on the horizon, mm -hmm. which is also yes. stu a stupid horizon. <laughs> okay. Here's my reply. Mm. A claustrophobic rural life where all is heard for miles around will make the air with rumors rife. The proud their theories propound. Some cravers of advice I read in council columns claim indeed that one's extended family, no exit right and none is free. Anyagin and Tatiana seem enwrapped in private lonely thought. In fouler net can birds be caught who travel in the realm of dream? Well, I'm required to end my sonnet. That grants me time to ponder on. <laughs> okay, I think I got lost. Tatiana's going to marry the friend? No, Tatiana is not going to marry anybody yet oh. because she's been sitting by herself in a corner. And okay. Eugene has pretty much been sitting also off to one side, but they've made an impression as having the same kind of personality. I'm surprised okay. really that so many of the villagers are putting them together in the gossip because mm -hmm. really I haven't seen in this text any ground for it. But mm -hmm. uh, you, it, it, there's not much to do in the village. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and if you're going to talk, you have to have something to say. And it g gives the impression that a single man comes to visit a family, he must be going to be married. It looks that someone. way. It sure does look yes, that way. It does, yeah. But as for Lensky and Olga, they're made for each other. Yeah. Tatiana heard with hot vexation the gossip. Yet in secret, she, with unexplainable elation, would think of it unwillingly. The thought had fallen from above. The time had come. She was in love. Thus, in the earth a fallen seed, the flaming vernal call may heed. Thus, long in her imagination, with languor and with anguish burning, with heartfelt and with martyred yearning, she thirsted for determination, the pressure and the tension grew. She'd waited. He would come. She knew. <laughs> on love and on imagination, we pondering dete detect that each in strength of mental divagation, if treacherous, can touch and teach. Strong women in the Shakespeare plays recall to me his courting days, or rather hers, Anne Hathaway's, for she was older, he in Hayes. <laughs> when children came, he soon had left 
for London solitude instead, bequeathed to her the second bed, a question who was then bereft. Imaginings and love entwine in ways we rarely may design. Do you ever thought about the Shakespeare's and their married life? Yes, I'm trying to remember where I saw there was a film, a brief film about Shakespeare's marriage. Uh huh. But I can't remember. It's part of Lyceum. And uh, it sounds true that Anne Hathaway took charge. Well, she was definitely older, and the children yes. were born quite soon after the marriage. Yes. And, uh, but then he left her there in, in Stratford while he pursued his dramatic career. But I have to say that even though it always puzzles people that in Shakespeare's will, he leaves his wife the second best bed. Nobody yes. isn't doing quite <laughs> to make of that. Nonetheless, he did not exactly abandon her permanently. He came back and they had a presumably reasonable enough domestic life together while he went into the business of investing in real estate. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, who got the first bed? <laughs> That's what I wonder. The best bed. <laughs> I would love to be able to contribute, but I know my limitations. All right. <laughs> hmm. The waiting's over. Out away. She's now decided. It is he. And two, alas, by night or day, sleep fevered, lonely, dreamily, all's filled with him. To her at length, by unrelenting magic strength, all speaks of him. They irritate the tones of tender talk elate. The servant girl, officious eyed, no guests are welcomed by the maiden with heavy desolation laden. Their idle chatter she'll deride. Like their arrival unawaited and pressing presence unabated. Hmm. Great botheration here may be in brusque, unwanted, rude intrusion of daily plain reality, usurped the rule of pure illusion. A love secure at center may embrace within extended ray all things it will be warming and be Midas with transforming hand of golden light. Love throws out fear, or so we're led to understand. But trouble hard to countermand confronts a bubble dweller. We're just nothings when we try a role. We didn't write and fight the soul. Hmm. And wrapped with what alert attention she'll read a novel, honey sweet, with animated apprehension, imbibe the flattering deceit. Creations granted life and power, inspired by gladsome dreaming hour. The lover of Julie Volmar, Malek Adel and Delinar, and rebel Werther had a whirl. Incomparable Grandison, who always wearied me for one, were for the tender dreaming girl in single image duly stored of dear Eugene, whom she adored. We do see a problem, don't we? If you're brought up a, as a village girl and uh, he, he, there's nothing really available to you uh, in making life decisions except those terrible media. Mm -hmm. And so here it, it isn't uh, what is it, Brad Pitt or uh, or Tom Cruise. It's those novels written by the yes. French and English. <laughs> and, but they put you into a dream state, which may mm -hmm. or not be good for you. Hmm. The memories crowd thick and fast. Romances floating as an ocean of fancies gathered from the past and present in a magic potion contained, compressed, and recombined had maddened Don Quixote's mind and in the 19th century would enter Mrs. Bovary. Tatiana, Emma, sisters, twins. Mm. I hadn't thought of this before. We're going through a double door. The dizzied mind with fever spins. What concentrated image power Anyagin holds that Nimrod Tower? Interesting, isn't it? She might. Yeah. Like, uh, what did, what's Madame Bovary all about except a woman who reads and reads and reads? Yeah. And uh, uh, that it doesn't have a, a, uh, the best of effects, let's just say. Mm hmm. 
Uh, Imagine if, huh? Sorry. There she goes. <laughs> there she goes. There she goes. Imagining yeah. herself the queen of writers' long delightful groan, Clarissa, Julia, Delphine, Tatiana, still in woods alone, will wander with a parlous book that's poetical for perilous, and yeah. frequently will have a look and seek her secret fever dreams, the while her heart with fullness teems. She'll sigh, then, taking by the hand another zeal, another's grief, entranced to heart of true belief, a letter speaks for lover grand. But Jean, the news I'll gently break, for Grandison, you'd not mistake. Hmm. I dream, midsummer night we find, to creatures of the woods akin, Tatiana bright in fancies blind, self-transformation would begin. De Stahl, Rousseau, and Richardson complete what reading had begun by making her a one in three, Lucina, Diane, Hecate, the triple form of goddess moon, may hint at lunar fatal haze, canicular of dog star days, with stellar wand and silver shoon. I image her on grassy glen, reciting lines to absent men. Hmm. I'm having a lot of fun here. I yes. Enter into the tone of voice and state of mind, which yeah. is once uh, very romantic and hazy yeah. And, yeah. and gentle and empathetic. And at the same time, it's, yeah. it's got that Pushkin irony in the back of it. And I'm wondering what Eugene's going to do. Yeah, we're wondering. It's a fun book to read because yeah. these are not like the Shakespeare sonnets to, to, uh, in one regard. They are page turner sonnets. Yeah. Would you agree? I think they move you forward rather rapidly. I think they do, yes. I certainly want to know. Grand Tones would formerly assume in ardent flame the prose creator. His hero proudly he'd illume as Virgil's model advocator. His maker duly would endue him, though persecutors would pursue him, with spirit sensitive and wit and handsome face for goodness fit. The fire of passion chaste he'd nourish with never intermitted zeal, glad sacrifice for some ideal, and at the end would virtue flourish, while vice would get its penalty. In wreathed would merit surely be. <laughs> like the importance of being earnest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the novel in the good old days. Yes. Reply. A poet no identity can have, so wrote the youthful Keats. More truthful adage never he produced. A mixed emotion greets the reader of this fine digression, where any stated faith profession is highly tinged with irony, as writing many-mindedly the verser turns chameleonic. Is virtue dull? A foolish moon on fool's horizon? Ah, but soon her charms revealed. A healing tonic, a subtle flavor stays behind. A favor from a vagrant mind. <sighs> Today, though, minds are in a mist. Morality's thought sleepy-making. In living, vice is liked and bliss. In fiction, seen the triumph taking. The British muse ascending crescent perturbs the dreaming adolescent. Her idle guide in fancy free may now the brooding vampire be. Uh, in other words, is a big fad, fad now, rather a disturbing one, different from Richardson and Rousseau. This is the trend of the Gothic novel. Yeah. Pretty soon. Well, we, I, yeah. We'll be having yeah. Mary Shelley and Frankenstein before long. Yeah. But my daughter pointed out the Twilight series. They're written for young adolescents. And that's, I guess, what she said anyway, is they're never consummated. Is, is, do you mean the Twilight Zone on TV? No. the um, There's a series for young people called Twilight, different Twilight books, and they're about a vampire. Oh. 
a non-vampire. It's a it's a romance between a vampire and conflict with the what do they call those wolf people? Werewolf. Uh -huh. Werewolf. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a set of novels for young women. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, but but yes. not consummated so that uh, uh, right. you're, left, you're left in a state of ver reverie, very like that of Tatiana. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Or Mel Melmoth, vagrant, gothic, sinning, eternal Jew or brave corsair. That means a pirate. Zbogar, mm -hmm. with strange and riddling air. Lord Byron has capricious, winning, displayed a sad romanticism and desperation's egotism. Mm. Reply. A witty diagnostic guide and nicely psychoanalytic, the poet in his long aside soliloquy can speak as critic. In strange Zbogar of Charles Nodier or Matthew Lewis, Monk will say, where the eternal Jew appears, or Byron's pirate whom one fears, we models for Anyagin find, who loved himself as Harold did. That's child Harold of Lord Byron. Mm -hmm. The double, the doubles never truly hid, but Hyde can make the Jekyll blind when child projected on the scene, ill-tinted by a vivid spleen. Hmm. You notice how conveniently the characters are named in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yes. I noticed also that you added the E to child. I, I did that because of Lord Byron. Child, child Harold, yeah. With an E. A it child. Is, hmm? uh, I've never read Child Harold, so. Uh, it's a magnificent book. It, yeah. It's a magnificent book. He does love himself, but at the same time, he does have a tremendous amount of ability. And he sings in a more complicated stanza than this, and with perfection always, and with tremendous vigor. Uh, basically, Child Harold's pilgrimage is, is a traveler's guide. He's going through Europe, and he's going through Europe at one of the most dramatic, fascinating, and chaotic periods of its history, the time of the Napoleonic Wars. He, he visits Waterloo. Oh, my. I didn't it's know a, that. Huh? I didn't know that. Wow. It's, a, it's a wonderful poem. And as far as the child, uh, it, it, with an E, it's, a, it's an uh, archaic word that meant a candidate for knighthood in, in the okay. Middle Ages. And Lord Byron happens to be an aristocrat. He is a lord. He's a noble poet. Mm -hmm. And he has inherited an estate, which used to be a monastery. But you know that predatory King Henry VIII, what yes. he did to monasteries. Yeah. Yes, I have often talked to Child Harold, and I've read a lot. Uh, uh, I've written something, written an article, actually, on Byron and focused on the Child Harold. Oh. Uh, Byron is an amazing writer. He, he, he uh, wrote plays which were stage worthy. He wrote one in particular called Cain, which is the psychology of the murderer in the Bible. Uh, and Byron has a lot to say about a people with a crime with lots of guilt and a whole lot of problems and Goethe the greatest German poet of the age said that he thought Byron's play Cain was the greatest poem of the era Blake on the other hand thought that you shouldn't write a play on a topic like that without providing some help and at the end Byron's Cain is just as miserable as he was on, on page one. So what Blake did is he wrote a two-page uh, poem in reply to Lord Byron, and he addressed it to Lord Byron in the wilderness. What dost thou hear, Elijah? In other words, if you have <laughs> poetic and prophetic powers, you should be doing something in, to help about Cain and not just give us <laughs> this messy a case of a guy who has no way out. <laughs> uh, 313 I think is where we are yeah so where's the meaning here my friends it well may be that heaven's will might say 
your time as poet ends. New demon then the mind to fill. May Phoebus' form no more disclose, but lower me to life in prose. With model on the older line, all novels write in my decline. No torments hid of a villainy will I portray so threatening, but plain relate a simpler thing. An old style Russian family I'll paint. Love's captivating dream and ancient habit, pure, pristine. I think Olga would like to read a book like that, but I don't think Pushkin will ever write it. <laughs> no. The, me the feeling mixed of which I spoke before comes through quite clearly now. Indeed, the poet doesn't joke entirely, for we must allow he plied a mastercraft in prose. Uh, he wrote short stories, very good ones. Mm. The first Russian short story I ever read was called Vustru, The Shot. It should be read. It's really good. Thanks. But lyric bloomings, too, arose. Nostalgia's rural legacy is, too, involved in fictions he in latter years would glad compose. A poet's a chameleon, as Keats had claimed, were never done with changing color, so I glows our speculative reverie, whose tenderness appeals to me. Mm -hmm. Glows means gloss or interpret. Okay. I, I, I'm the interpreter of a poet. Being one, as you can tell from reading this book, I am yeah. permitted to have a few words to say about them. Then I'll retell the simple greetings of father or of uncle old, the young folks' predetermined meetings by linden tree near streamlet cold, unhappy envy's calculations, farewells, then reconciliations, more discord, yes, but in the end, to marriage altar will they wend. Words passion languid, I'll recall, that when I kneeled in early days at my beloved's feet, in praise for my enchanted lips would fall. I such indulgence will allow, Though disaccustomed to it, <laughs> though disaccustomed to it now, nostalgic and detailed, bucolic, such would the realism be, where melancholies blent with frolic in re-engendered memory. That in George Eliot I see, abandoned Christianity returns when self-denying saints the new enlightened writer paints. Thus Romola and Dorothea. Mill on the Floss and Adam Bede would similarly be, indeed, embodying the praised idea that faithful heart and family are bastions of humanity. Little essay on George Eliot there. Yeah. Tatiana, my Tatiana dear, I'm weeping doleful tears for you. For to a modish tyrant drear, your fate you've trusted, ever true. My dear, you'll perish, yet before that happens, blinding hopes adore, dark blessedness whereon you call. Yes, comforts and caresses all you feel, drink want envenomed wine, while dreams that hunt and haunt you sing. You're everywhere imagining a shelter for a trysting time, and everywhere he's met your eyes, your fateful waiting tempter lies. Trysting is a rendezvous. Mm -hmm. okay. She's always dreaming of the next meeting she'll have with him. Yeah. Ah, oh, tempter, yes, revealing word. In Sistine Chapel I can see the still quite manlike serpent spurred ancestral Eve from rule to free. With human face he gazes and extends to her a human hand to meet her own, as Adams met our gods who could a world beget. Twin images of touching hands reflect the puzzle that we face to tell a tempter's god from grace. Who'd honor well, the soul commands. False prophecy let tell from true. Tatiana, love, good luck to you. It's so it nice the way he acts as if 
he's an outsider just you know mm -hmm. looking in looking in oh what an anguish in romance she goes to grieve in garden now and bowing down her eyes and brow she lets her lassitude advance behold her heaving breast her cheek a moment flaming love to speak her breath has failed her softly dies ears roaring brightness in her eyes the night comes on the moon surveys the vault of heaven at her ease the nightingale in misty trees a canorous refrain essays tatiana vigil keeps and she to nanny murmurs quietly hmm. and i'm think thinking about the nightingale having been mentioned, Pushkin wrote a poem about the nightingale and, and the Persians have been writing about it for centuries. I've published lots of translations of Persian poems and therefore I necessarily have published lots of translations of, of a nightingale singing to roses. The okay. nightingale in Sufi poetry is uh, a poetry written largely in the Persian language. That nightingale is the seeking pilgrim soul. And the rose, that it serenades is the vision of God that it has been granted so far to see. So a nightingale in love with a rose for a Persian, um, a Sufi poet is an emblem of a man in love with a woman or in the soul in love with the deity. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They quickly turn religious. And the distinguishing feature of Persian poetry, which I never get tired of and always fascinates me because I like it so much, is that you cannot tell in a Persian love poem whether it's a man talking to a woman or maybe even another man or whether he's talking to God Almighty himself. It's, uh, it's not considered to be important. Mm -hmm. After all, if you love a human, you're loving an image of God. That's nice. Very, very nice. This when one, Nightingale, huh? Sorry. I was just going to ask you about Janani murmurs quietly. She's she's seeking comfort. Yes. Okay. Well, when we turn the page, we'll see. All right. Nanny has to say, I have to say, and I told you that the, the nanny is the one who taught uh, Pushkin the glories of traditional Russian folk poetry. Yes. The, uh, we know the name of the nanny. Her name is Arina Radionovna. Now, the common, mm -hmm. the, the common practice on the serf estates of this plantation society in Russia before the emancipation was mm -hmm. that a serf woman would be uh, uh, hired as a nanny for the aristocratic yeah. uh, child and would grow up with this child and become very much a part of the family. Mm. Okay. So here's Tatiana. She's a young woman. She's falling in love. She's thinking about getting married and she's still, well, she needs help from nanny. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. And here's what I have to say. When, right. night when Nightingale I hear, there comes of Persian verse a memory. Romancing he the halidoms of timid rose will laud, while she, we hope, will listen. Maybe not. Perhaps, as in Tatiana's thought, of mute Anyagin, there may be frustration. Over readily had she too quickly filled the void of silence with desire unbound. When skeptical, our poet found a symbol for the soul annoyed. We'll switch the genders. Let her be the bird, the silent flower he. Hmm. Now I give you a little short poem I translated by okay. Pushkin, called fittingly Nightingale and Rose. In spring, in quiet gardens, in the dark of night, the eastern nightingale sings to the rose bloom bright. The lovely rose, though, will not hear will not attend, but sway and doze until the lover's hymn will end. Does he not sing your tune for beauty that is cold? Remember, poet, what you're aiming for, so bold. She will not hearken, cannot know the poet's mind. You look, she blooms. You call, yet no reply you'll find. 
Hmm. I'm afraid Pushkin doesn't know or doesn't care about Sufi tradition and the fact that <laughs> she, the Nightingale might very well be calling on God. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as Pushkin is concerned, this is an unhappy love affair of a sort that he has himself had all too often. Okay, the nanny shows up. Can't fall asleep. Too stifling here. The window, air, come sit with me. Why, Tanya, what's the matter, dear? Tell nanny how things used to be. I'm bored. What might you have in mind? When I was younger, I could find in memory old tales for sure of evil spirit, maiden pure. Today, mere dark. The things I knew, so many, but they've flown away. It's come indeed, the evil day, all shattered. Nanny, tell me true. I'll be more clear. I'll try again. Did, did you fall in love back then? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just taking some deep breaths. Have to take a little break after that one. There's <laughs> so much tension in that. Yes, yes, yes. That is so beautifully made, isn't it? You can really see those women. Yes. They're really alive. Yeah, they are, yes. Here's my attempt at a reply. Mm. In Russian, what would one would not quite fall. The verb is love plus into. We talk about falling in love. But in, in Russian, uh, you don't have they don't use the word fall. The verb is love plus into. You love into someone. It's more active. Uh, that's right. That's right. You didn't stumble and fall. Yeah. Thus, direction, yes, impulsion, all that goes with motion. But for us, in English, there's a downward slide. How passive. Passion. As a matter of fact, the word passion is related to the word passive. How? Because in Latin, pati or pati, passus meant meant uh, to suffer. Oh. Well, let's see. Here we go. How passive passion, so abide the thoughts of Greek philosophers. Wise Aristotle firm avers. The intellect is active and immortal, for we comprehend the noble truths that never end. To feel must mean we understand far less, and much of reason dies. A greater mm -hmm. fall. I realize. Mm. Okay, the immortal soul, exalted by both Plato and Aristotle, who contributed a lot of religious feeling to Christianity, um, the immortal soul uh, is, was equivalent to intellect, not to passive passion, but to what was called the active intellect, which, is, which was an agent and not a patient. <laughs> Did you notice that patient not only means uh, passive and putting up with things, but also means a sick person. Yeah. And the opposite of an agent in Latin, uh, of, a, of, a, of a patient in Latin is an agent. One yeah. who acts. Yes, yeah. Wow. Where are we? Okay, we're at enough, dear Tanya. <laughs> yep. Snap enough. out of it. Sorry. <laughs> I said snap out of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that I translated that enough, dear Tanya, to snap out of it. I pictured the nanny telling her that. Pro uh, the non the the nanny is talking. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Enough, dear Tanya. Love's a word we'd never hear in times gone by. My husband's mother, had she heard of that? Oh, I'd be like to die. You never spoke of love for men. But how did you get married then? I was 13. Twas heaven's will. My Vanya, he was younger still. Two oh, weeks dear. to marry. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks the marriage broker kept, conferring with each relative, till father would permission give. He blessed me. 
frightened how I wept, my braids undone as fitting they, with singing churchward led churchward led the way. Mm. I give a little little uh, comment on that. In Shakespeare's play of Juliet, we learn she hath not seen the change of fourteen summers. Mm. Cheryl, do you remember that you're in Shakespeare Club? Yeah, you know, yeah. Romeo and Juliet. Yes, yes. Juliet is thirteen years old. Yes. Thus we get a sense, though one may find it strange, of early preparation for a maiden's love or marriage. War that supervened as well, we know, meant Juliet and Romeo would not be wed, yet if they had their wish, another winsome bride of 13 years of age would bide in memory, for good or bad, when lives are brief and the time is dear, adulthood might too soon appear. Yeah. Then to another household, they, but are you listening to me? Oh, Nanny, what a great dismay. Oh, I'm depressed. Oh, wretchedly. I might start crying I'm that sad. Oh, dear, my child, your health is bad. The Lord sent mercy, grace, and aid. What are you wanting? If I made, wait, holy water drops you need. You're burning up. It's nothing of the sort that, Nanny, I'm in love. Dear child, be blessed. May heaven heed. She offered words of mercy and she made a cross with fragile hand. The nanny, Beldame, comes to mind from Romeo and Juliet. In Keats' St. Agnes' Eve, a kind and frightened elder helpers met again. The women three combine, a child to bless with heaven's sign. When I the moving lines peruse, deep love may frighten, for we lose the power of stability. May readily be wounded by the one whose image in our eye depends on mental prophecy. In love we stumble when the soul cannot yet trust the other's role. Hmm. I am in love, she whispered to her nanny. That I'm telling of. My darling heart, you're ill, and you... Please leave me, nanny, I'm in love. And all the while the moon on high, a weary, languid light let lie on Tanya's pallid cheeks and fair her disarranged, disheveled hair, her teardrops on the bench before our heroine in her dismay. The kerchief nanny tresses gray, the padded jacket that she wore, a dreamlike atmosphere made still by captivating lunar will. Hmm. Rosetti Hunt Burne Jones Millet would readily have painted this. Details precise and heightened play a heartfelt part in lyric bliss, what with brooding and oniric light that by their literary sight they bring to make divine the form of reverie that's legend warm. Pre-Raphaelite, the Lady of Shalott, in moated grange, the one who'll weave more dream till autumn's done. To these envisioners of love, contemplative in wizardry, Tatiana seems akin to me. Yeah. Her heart is carried far away. Yeah. To moonlight, rays accustomed grow. She feels... A thought has come to stay. Please go. I need to be alone. Please, paper, nanny, and a pen. That table. I'll lie down and then good night. She's ready to begin. All's quiet, moonlight shining in. And head in hand, Tatiana writes, Eugene alone is on her mind. In style unpondered, 
unconfined, a maiden love breathes free, invites. The letter's done and folded soon. It's ready to be sent. To whom? <laughs> Do you think to heighten the suspense and get people to read this book, we should stop right there? <laughs> I'm only going to read ahead. I'm only going to find out what happened. But I see now why you said, she, did you say she should be the hero? That it should yeah. really be? Yeah. And she, we can care about her. I care yeah. about her. Yes. Well, Eugene is right now sort of a cipher, I think. A witch? You know, a cipher? I mean, you A cipher. That's, yeah. that, that's an unusual word. I didn't yeah. quite... I didn't expect to hear it. That's per yeah. that that's what he is. I said a zero, didn't I? That's a cipher. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. Hmm. This whole he's a mysterious guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, we need to learn, I think, more about him in order to make this novel a, a complete uh, undertaking. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the word uh, cipher will help us there too, because it can also mean code. Yeah. Well, yeah, at present, he's learned how to um, make social motions, but he doesn't seem to care about anybody, or he doesn't seem to. He may. I think you're right. And moreover, I don't think she yeah. has had a chance yet to know anything at all about him. Uh, Pushkin, him, her, was it Pushkin or did I do call her call it a bubble she was living in? But in yeah. it, whoever it was, I think it was it was it's correct to say that she her head is filled with with media heroes. Yes, well, that's true. So she might be, you think, thirteen or fourteen herself? No, I'm thinking she's older. Okay. I picture her as more like seventeen or eighteen. Okay. You, so she tell me fell. what because you, you don't I don't have any more clues really at this point than you do and so I'd like to hear well um she started out very self-contained and then it is like she caught almost like a disease mm -hmm. um which was this obsessive interest in Eugene mm -hmm. but you can't tell if he he doesn't seem to return it at all, particularly. He's very elusive, at least he seems to be. Yes. So her misery, which I think she is in misery, is almost, almost an obsession that stands alone, you know, that at this point, she thinks about him all the time, but she gets nothing no response from him. That's right. One reason why why we're having this, partly this discussion about how old she might be, and, and at least I don't feel I, I can say anything yeah. about it with confidence, is that she's a stronger character uh, than Olga. She was a stronger character from the start. And yeah. we, when we give a thought to what she's about to do, or rather has just done, she's written a letter. Yeah. And you don't do that, you know. But Jane Eyre might have done it. Yeah. Not very many other women, young women, would have done it. That's one mm -hmm. of the bolder things in uh, in the literature of this period. Yeah, thinking of uh, Jane Austen's characters. Yes, yes. Some of Jane Austen's women are very forthright and uh, yeah, yeah, knowledgeable. But they couldn't write letters. I think they couldn't uh, write no. to men. Certainly, no. They have yeah. to work in various devi devious and indirect yes. ways. Yeah. And she actually does that. And so uh, it's hard to guess her her behavior because she's so mature. That mm -hmm. is, she might be more mature than her than her chronological age. Yes, yeah. So I don't know what she did. See, <laughs> so the letter or anything. So I'm thinking, well, she's sure wrapped up with this guy. Well, what what is it? it? Isn't it? I didn't make that up, did I? Didn't she just write a letter? 
No, you probably did. Yes. I mean, I, we hadn't quite got there yet, but she Which planned to. Huh. Just as, wait a minute. Eugene alone well, actually, is a shit, It's ready. Listen, Eugene alone, uh, and head in hand, Tatiana writes, Eugene alone is on her mind. Okay. In style unpondered, unconfined, a maiden love breathes free, invites in the letter mm -hmm. while she's writing. The letter's done and folded soon. It's ready to be sent. To whom? Hmm. To me, it's to Eugene, I guess. I would guess. Yeah. I kind think it's asking of the question is not because Pushkin is puzzled, but because it's just so very new. She herself is probably a bit shocked that she, uh, uh, at the next stage that she has to undertake, or that she thinks she has to undertake, or that she <laughs> wants or doesn't, which is it, want to, to undertake? I have to read <laughs> 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 oh dear oh my goodness this is pretty masterful i guess well obviously <laughs> it obviously is well for somebody who worried so much about her style you know and and, mm -hmm. and uh, even defining what being in love was uh, i think you'll find the letter highly rewarding Pushkin is not going to let his his hero write a, sec a, a second or a third rate letter. I don't think I'm giving away too much by saying that. <laughs> okay. Huh. According to the Kindle, this is 35% into the book. So oh. there must be a whole lot left. There is. Okay. But most of the plot is left. We're oh, only. Yeah. I only <laughs> wanted to 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 uh, have a session where we'd get well grounded in in the yes. psychology of our hero. Yes. Yes. Well, thank I, you I felt that. it was. A, thank you. I thought it was as rewarding for me, at least, as uh, as, as reading about growing up of Jane Eyre. Yeah. She's yeah. It, she's really a, uh, a very special person, and uh, uh, no, you're quite right. Almost everything is left. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I mean, I don't think I would have ever, I don't think I would have ever read this. I've heard of it, but I didn't. I imagined it was about a Russian, like, um, not, oh, what's the one, uh, where they had the movie with the Teutonic Knights on the ice. Oh, shoot. Anyway. Uh, are you thinking of a, tragi a tragic uh, 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 presentation like the Boris opera of Mussorgsky? Uh, no? Well, there was a, a movie by a Russian uh, filmmaker. I mean, he's the one that did the Potemkin movie uh -huh, and uh -huh. Ivan the Terrible. Yes. There was one scene that um, was a about Boris Goodenough, maybe? Was that Could it? Uh -huh. So this was a battle between the Teutonic Knights and the Russians. And they had this great scene where the Teutonic Knights were on the ice and, and battling. And I just remembered the visual of that, the uh -huh. picture of that in my mind. So I was imagining that Eugenio Nengman was a warrior of some kind. Ah, very far from it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. One thing I should note, it would be a nice observation perhaps to end on, that uh, uh, one of the world's best operas was made out of this book. Uh, Tchaikovsky wrote it. It's called Eugene oh. Onegin by Tchaikovsky. Okay. And uh, it's a wonderful thing, except that it isn't this book. Uh, this book has something that Tchaikovsky couldn't figure out how to put into the opera, and I don't see how I could have, or anyone could have thought, be, and that is the Pushkin intruder who butts in and talks about himself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's none of that in the opera, and since no. then, the main source of the humor is Pushkin's humor. Yes. Uh, yeah. the, the opera is not, not at all amusing. No. It's just gorgeous. That's all. Lovely yeah, things yeah, everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So after you've read the book, 
uh, by all means, check out the opera. Okay, thanks. But I think I get what you're saying. I think the opera would tell the story. But when you get Pushkin's comments on the story, it's really quite funny in many, many ways. It's like comments on human nature. At least that's yes. what I think so far. Yes, yes. Uh, he, yeah. he, become, he becomes a character just as important as the rest of them. Yes, yeah. And poor Tchaikovsky couldn't do that. No. But no. that's the limitations of the operatic form. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks. So, thank you very much. Good night. Good night.